January 27, and this is vlog number 215. And sometimes I like to just come up here and appreciate this point of view, uh, this time of day when the when the Jesus the Good Shepherd window is backlit like this. Isn't that beautiful? What a great view. And it's a great view if you are working uh, with the at the tech center where the where um, when we have a Sunday morning service going out virtually, it goes from right there. The person that is handling the equipment makes sure the visual and the sound comes through. And it might be that you're being called to join the team, the tech team, and and doing that. It's a great training program. There's no pressure. They don't make you do it till you're ready. So maybe someone will step forward and do that. Uh, that would be a way to use a natural gift that God has given you or a natural interest God has given you and probably in some way the spiritual gift God has given you. I've been talking about spiritual gifts for two weeks. I have one more Sunday to conclude this series on spiritual gifts and I hope you've had a chance to go online and take the spiritual gift survey that um, is available through churchgrowth.org. You can do a search for spiritual gifts survey and and find that pretty easily. It takes about 20 minutes to do, and I redid it, as I mentioned in, um, in the sermon on Sunday. And I had someone say that when they joined the church, they took that, and they just retook it, and it confirmed that their gift is pretty much the same. And I've been hearing some similar things from people. It kind of affirms what you should be doing and what God has given you, and may it be a blessing to you so that you can be a blessing to others. So I encourage you to do that. This week, you should have received a letter from our Finance and Stewardship Committee. And if you give um, and uh, use the envelope so that they know who is giving, and it's not just some cash, if you give in that way, you will have your statement of giving from 2021, if you gave last year. And also the stewardship letter very carefully lines out the situation where we are in financially. We are so appreciative of people that through this pandemic have continued to be faithful in their giving. And uh, if that has not been something you were able to do, but you can now, that will very much be appreciated in this coming year so that we can continue the adjusting and changing ministry that we have before us. And uh, let me, oh, I had a meeting this past week with, was it last? I can't remember now, uh, with our deacons. And we did a little bit of a study in scripture of what deacons are. Now in Acts 6, you can read about when the, the apostles first appointed deacons to, to join in and help out with some of the work that was um, taking the apostles away from some of the spiritual ministry that they had to do. And the first, one of the first people who becomes a deacon is a man named Stephen, and my namesake, and he ends up losing his life because he takes a stand for Jesus. But he's, he's a hero of mine because of that. And so we get a beginning of the understanding of deacons from there, and then they're described in a letter that the Apostle Paul writes to the young pastor Timothy in 1 Timothy 3 verses, well, I'm just going to read um, 8 to 10. And he goes on for a few more verses beyond that. And before that, he's writing about other leaders in the church that he calls overseers. But here's what he's saying about the qualifications of deacons. In the same way, deacons are to be worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in too much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there's nothing against them, then let them serve as deacons. So it gives a little bit of the, more of the character that they're trustworthy, and they've been tested, and, and they're good people that are going to do the right thing for the church. And as we continue to discuss what that can mean for deacons in our congregation, we started to see deacons as sort of utility players, uh, like special teams in, in football, and in other ways, people that can jump in, help out where there's a need, they can adapt, and they're not just locked into one way of doing things and serving. 
And so um, I'm praying for the deacons to really step up and, and uh, minister in that way. And thanks to Martha for her leadership in, in getting the ball rolling in that way. For our prayers today, I want to pray for the deacons and for all of us to find our gifts and use them. And for people that haven't figured out before, especially to pray for them. And there's also a prayer concern. Uh, there's been a death in the church. I'll include that in the prayers. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the, the new focus with the deacons. And we pray that you would open up ways, clear ways for them to step in and to minister and lead in this congregation. And I pray for all members of the congregation that they will fit in and plug in and get involved in ways, if they haven't before, that utilize the gifts that you have given them, spiritual gifts and also natural gifts. And may everyone have play their role in building one another up for the common good. We pray for that in Jesus' name. And we also lift up um, the loved ones of Joan and Toronto, who just recently passed away. Our service will be uh, Saturday, February 5th. As you know very well, much better than I do, Lord, she suffered so much of the last years of her life and was always wondering, how long, Lord? Why, why do you keep me here? What is my purpose and why can't I die? And I give thanks that she is at peace and that you're revealing to her just how great and wonderful your love is. But in the meantime, I do pray for others who suffer and don't have a clear reason why they have to suffer. Uh, we pray for your peace for them. We pray that the suffering would be alleviated. And in the meantime, we pray for um, peace and understanding. We pray for her family in this time that you give them your peace. In Jesus' name, amen. The song that I recorded a little earlier today outside, my fingers were freezing, uh, was, is called They Call the Wind Mariah. And that came from the 1951 Broadway musical Paint Your Wagon. And I remember my grandfather singing that song. It's, a, it's an interesting and neat song. I understand Mariah Carey was named after that. And I wonder if Mariah Elser from our church family was named after that song. It was the most popular song among the troops in the Korean War um, in the, the 50s. And it, it talks about longing and a lost love and wanting to be back, but also the cold wind. And I think it really connected with people's imagination. I just learned it because I am preparing um, later this week to sing at a retirement home and i'm bringing all western songs which will include a lot of cowboy songs but a little bit of railroad songs a little bit of minor 49er kind of songs and uh, it's been fun preparing that i'll be sharing that soon and um, the song i'm going to share right now is one of the few gospel songs that was voted by western writers among the top 100 western songs in America of all time. And uh, so uh, this is number 80 something, but it's a gospel song written in 1891. I'll just sing the first verse and chorus. It's called Mountain Railroad, or sometimes it's called Life is Mo Like a Mountain Railroad. It goes like this. Life is like a mountain railroad with an engineer that's brave. We must make the run successful from the cradle to the grave. Watch the curves that fills the tunnels. Never fall, turn, never quail. Keep your hand upon the throttle and your eye upon the rail. Blessed Savior, thou wilt guide us till we reach that blissful shore where the angels wait to join us in thy praise forevermore. Mountain Railroad. Good Western railroad-themed gospel song. God bless you. <laughs> 